All right, so good afternoon, and thanks everybody that's able to participate today. Um, today we're going to dive into um, Grazing Management 101 in the first part of this webinar, and then we're going to um, segue directly into uh, the conservation planning on grazing land series, starting with the inventory process and focusing on the, um, on the mapping elements primarily of the, of the inventory. Um, and, and touching on a few of the other things that we kind of need in order to move towards being able to analyze things. But we'll get to that in a few. Just a few reminders. Um, there's a poll up. Please sign in as you enter the meeting. Please be sure your computer is muted um, so we don't get feedback if you unmute your phone. And feel free to unmute your phone whenever you have a question. Thank you. All right, so, so far in the previous webinars, we've talked about forages and we've talked about grazing animals. We've talked about forages and some of the things and the concepts related to forages, such as where their growing points are, well, how their physiology kind of works, what their growth phases are, how they reproduce, what factors affect forage quality, what factors affect plant vigor, and we talked about disturbances to plants and how they respond to that. And then when we talked about grazing animals, we talked real generally about some of the things to be considering and, and understanding, such as what the producer might be going for in his market goals. Um, we talked to basically about animal physiology and the different um, types of digestive systems that we're working with on grazing lands. We talked a little about livestock nutrition and how that's reflected in their condition. And we talked about how physiological states and circumstances can affect forage intake and how we um, talk about forage intake um, when this, with this term of animal units. So moving on today, let's just kind of start with just, you know, asking ourselves what is grazing management? Um, as many answers as there are people you could ask it. And, you know, these, these two answers kind of sum it up. Um, the, according to the University of Florida, they describe it as the manipulation of livestock grazing to accomplish a desired result. It's a good answer. Um, <clears throat> Susan Sheenan talks about it as controlling the grazing habits of animals on pasture. I thought that was kind of interesting, but in an indirect kind of way, maybe that is what we're doing. Um, when I started trying to put this together, I, I kind of came up with this graphic. And, you know, basically, grazing management is a whole series of decisions that get made regarding the two parts of this whole that, that we refer to as a grazing land ecosystem. So it's the grazing animals and the pastures or the resource base that they are on. It's really about a lot of different things, including how many and what kinds of animals are being grazed, where and how long and when they graze, and when they come back to that same area. Um, all of that has the potential to influence the pastures the, the forage side of the equation, the pasture composition, the yield, the animal's performance, the environmental health, all of that which influences how many and what kinds of animals can graze again. So it's this real um, cyclic, holistic, uh, ecological, uh, obviously, it's an ecological system. And um, when we're talking about grazing management, we're really needing to bring together the understandings of forages and of grazing animals and, and their physiologies and, and ecological um, systems. And conceptually, all that we've discussed about how forage plants grow and what affects their quality and how grazing animals are built and what they can eat and why and all that is well and good, but when we start to bring those two things together, especially trying to put them out there in the real world where we work, it starts getting kind of complicated, and we need to be able to take a look at what we've got and apply the concepts of grazing line ecology to do our job of helping to identify problems and their causes and the potential solutions. So we're going to talk about some of that today. In grazing management, when we consider the forage side of the system, we need to consider some of the factors that influence the forages. So for example, seasonal, spatial, and physical factors have definite impacts on species composition, for, uh, forage yield, and quality. 
We also need to understand how forages respond to grazing, which, if we remember, is a type of disturbance to a plant. And we also have to consider the factors that influence selective grazing and how that, in turn, affects pasture composition, yield, quality, and the health of the forage resource. You know, it's all important stuff to be aware of. And, you know, all these things in the pink boxes, they're all related to the factors that affect plant vigor that we discussed two webinars ago, if you really, you know, kind of step back and think about it from the big picture. So let's get into some of these. Uh, when we're talking about seasonal and spatial factors, all right, um, location drives most of most of that here in the tropics um, because it will affect you know, your, your average rainfall and temperature. And that's a given with for your site, and it's important to understand how that can affect the species composition of your grazing land, your growth, your production, and uh, seasonal availability throughout the year. Here in the tropics, we don't have the luxury of you know, these wonderful forage growth curves that they have across a lot of the continents. Um, we, we don't have those that would fit all of the diverse sites and the pasture settings that we work in. There is some data out there, here and there, but you know, you'd still need to apply it to the specific seasonal weather pattern unique to the location of the site that you're working in. So these um, forage growth curve plots that I have up on the screen are generated out of our 528 planning tool that Adam and Preston um, put together. And <clears throat> that, um, that model, is, it can be really useful. And, and um, we'll get into that more uh, in the webinars, in, in the last webinar of this series. But this just helps to illustrate just the diversity of growing conditions that we work across. This was um, just a real quick way to, to demonstrate that. And you guys all know this already. but. Okay, when it comes to the season of grazing and really kind of talking about the seasonality, um, if you read in the literature, the timing of grazing on the continent, is they're, they're kind of thinking about it from a little bit of a different perspective than we do here in the tropics. Um, we've got a little bit of a different situation. We, we can have growing conditions all year long. And um, so it's important to think about season as far as whether it's the growing season or the non-growing season, if it's really distinct where you're working or if it's a little more blurred if you're in the fast growing season versus a slower growing season. That's usually driven by rainfall, although in some areas it's also affected by um, temperature and, and even day length in some places. Um, and when you're considering seasonality and, and the season that you're grazing, um, it's also you know, something to think about is whether or not the desirable forages in the stand, um, when they need, how they need to reproduce and whether or not they are reliant on reproducing via seed production um, in order to increase the species in a stand or ensure persistence of that species in a stand, um, then season can matter because some of our grasses, um, they, they set seed more seasonally. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's about it. All right, when we're talking about physical factors, even given a typical growth patterns or expected forage production amounts, the physical factors affecting a site will have an effect on production. Things like your soil limitations, um, whether you're on a rocky soil, like a rocky, outco uh, rocky um, outcrop, or if you've got real good deep well-drained soils, or if you have soils that are really swampy. Um, your topography matters, um, your whether or not the site has a lot of areas that are heavily shaded. Um, where it's going to affect production. Whether you are working in an area that has a lot of eroded areas where you have sediment deposition and areas where topsoil has been completely removed, those are all physical factors that are going to affect production. And the state of the, the pasture that you're working in, just the overall condition, that also should be a factor that's being considered when you're starting to look at a site and um, think about its productive capabilities. And then there's the grazing. The ability and way with which a forage plant will respond to grazing depends on the characteristics of the grazing. How intense it is, is it? What height was it grazed down to? How much of that leaf was removed? Um, were there growing points that are being removed during grazing? Um, are there effects below ground? Frequency and duration of grazing 
have to do with how often a pasture is grazed, how long that pasture is grazed, and then how long it's rested in between grazing periods. It also has the ability to influence whether or not forage plants are vulnerable to the second bite, so we call it. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And then coming back to timing, kind of related to the seasonality that we just talked about, you know, the forage, the ability of a forage plant to respond to grazing somewhat depends on what the growing conditions are and whether we're in a fast growing season or a slow growing season. And um, we again want to consider the plant's reproductive needs um, and what stage that that plant is in when it's grazed and it, how that might affect its ability to regrow. Differences in grass morphology influence tolerance to grazing heights. We don't, we don't see all of these specific grasses here in this slide commonly here in the tropics, but the same kind of differences exist in our forages. Guinea grass, for example, is a strong bunch grass whose growing points do get elevated, and that, like the orchard and the fescue in this slide, probably has significant energy stored in its stem. We know it doesn't tolerate close grazing as well as our stoloniferous grasses like Kikuyu or Pangola, whose growing points are generally lower, like the Bermuda and the bluegrass in the slide. Um, but not all stoloniferous grasses even can tolerate close grazing. California grass, for example, cannot. So, you know, my, my point with this is to be aware of your forage plants and their physiology so that you can understand what effect different levels of grazing intensity could have. This is also why stubble heights are incorporated in our prescribed grazing spec because it, it has a big impact on, on forages and their ability to produce. Um, the residual, again, the grazing height, again, um, and so the grazing height and it's the corresponding residual amount, what's left after grazing, these both have the ability to affect your photosynthetic ability of that plant and its energy reserves. So as these slides show, same plant, if you graze it to different heights, you're going to have a different effect on that plant's stored energy, as well as that plant's ability to actively photosynthesize to produce energy for regrowth. When there's inadequate residual and it's grazed too low, this plant has to mobilize more of its stored energy and stored carbohydrates from its roots and stems in order to regrow new leaves and, um, and, and complete its, its physiological processes. However, when the grazing height is higher and more is left after, after grazing, then this plant now has some solar panels still left that it can start using for photosynthesis, and it doesn't have to rely so heavily on its stored carbohydrates. It, it may use um, energy that's being actively um, synthesized from, from the sun in order to support that new growth. And so remember that, you know, even the root infrastructure, it has a maintenance cost too. And if the plant is not able to photosynthesize enough energy to support itself, it will need to downsize itself to a level that it can support for its environment. So, you know, this idea of intensity or how much the grazing height, what level we're taking it down to, it has the impact, it does have impact underground. Charlie Orchard can be quoted saying, what you do to the plant above the ground affects the plant below the ground. And um, this graphic is a real easy uh, one to, to look at. I've shared it a ton with my clients because it, it does paint a really good picture. The more of that above ground biomass that we're taking off, we're starting to have an impact on the roots uh, to the point that they stop growing for a long period of time. Um, but if we are a little bit lighter in our impact, we can have no root stoppage and the plant has got that much more hardware with which to grow back. And so the old rule of thumb of take half, leave half, you know, it, it got created for a reason. And this is one of the, this is some of the science that helps to support that, that theory. Um, it, it leaves adequate residual, so you have lots of uh, potential for that plant to continue photosynthesizing if it's got its other needs met, like moisture. Um, it has little to no effect to roots. It usually doesn't have an effect to growing points. And for us, from a conservation standpoint, the amount of resi residual that's left also has benefits to other elements of soil health, like preventing soil erosion and um, conserving soil moisture and things like that. 
so I got this right out of the uh, National Range and Pasture Handbook, and I added this in here because I found it was really interesting where it not only talks about um, root growth stoppage, but it talks about how long it takes or, or what's happening even beyond that. And so, for example, with a real heavy utilization, after 33 days, after one month, you still only got 60% of root growth. But if you jump down to like 60%, now we've taken a little more than half, we had approximately 55% of root growth after five days. Okay, so that's, that's a little better. We can, at least the roots are still, are, are coming back online after five days. And by, the th by one month later, you got 192% root growth. So it's recovering a lot better here than it would be if it was at 90. And if we go down and we look at 50%, Average 3% uh, root growth stoppage for 14 days, 223% uh, root growth on the 33rd day. So that I found to be really kind of fascinating because, you know, it's, it's a natural thing that roots are going to die off. It is a part of that natural process, but the degree of grazing can have a real significant impact on how, that, how that's occurring and how long it takes for that plant to recover its below ground infrastructure as well as putting out new leaf for another ground of grazing um, in the future. So all this is related to our plant vigor, yeah? And when we start talking about frequency and duration, here we have some evidence of how frequency can impact production. These grass plants were grazed to the same intensity or grazing height, but at different frequencies. So you can see a big difference in above ground and below ground plant structure. The differences show how crucial recovery period is to a grass plant that has been disturbed, both for above ground production and below ground health. The graph on the right makes a couple of interesting points. Um, with a shorter recovery period, although the quality is high and the, the quantity is quite low, and if we can extend that recovery period out, we get this exponential increase in quantity, and as the next set of slides will show, we actually get more production. So this next set of slides I got from a counterpart of mine, um, and this study I found just was really fascinating. So they took orchard grass plants growing in a greenhouse, managed them the same for six months, they were clipped once a month, they had their, all their needs met, they're happy grass plants. Then they took them and they took the plant on the left and they treated it as if it was being continuously grazed. They clipped it to a one inch height and they clipped it every week for the next four weeks at that one inch height. The, right, the plant on, that's gonna be showing up on the right, they tried to simulate something more like rotational grazing. They initially clipped it to a three and a half inch height and they clipped it again at three and a half inches four weeks later. So there's gonna be time-lapse photography that we're gonna look at that's gonna begin at the fifth week, okay? And it's gonna go for both plants. I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly so you can see the effect and I hope the delay doesn't mess it up. So one day after clipping, the plant on the left, again, is uh, continuous grazing. The plant on the right is rotational. Day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Those two plants responded pretty differently based on what they had experienced. So I'm just going to go back. And so again, the one on the left was clipped to one inch once a week for four weeks. The plant on the right was only clipped to three and a half inches, and then it was given a four-week recovery period. And then in the days that followed that second clipping, or the, the, the last clipping at four weeks, this was the plant's responses. Pretty cool, huh? So if we, if we look at these two and we start thinking about it, the one on the left, probably had maybe 90% removal. Unfortunately, there wasn't a picture of the grass before clipping, which would have been kind of cool, but um, let's assume it's about a 90% removal. So, and we know that it was meant to mimic real high intensity, frequent removal, long duration grazing, short you know, to no rest period. Versus the plant on the right, maybe had 60% removal at the beginning. It was a, more of a moderate intensity grazing scenario it was trying to model. Um, more infrequent removal once every four weeks and short duration period. It was eaten once, 
and I had a nice long rest period. Six days later, those plants are, are looking really different. And so the point for this is just to say that the type of grazing affects production. And the time then the time that's really needed for that plant to recover too. Anyway, I thought that was cool. I hope you did too. Um, timing. So depending on whether the grazing occurs during the fast or the slow growing time of the year, it might be beneficial to vary that grazing and recovery period. And so I, I put this same slide that I had earlier, I put this here again. And I just wanted to kind of draw your attention to noticing that we got a fast growth period here on this horizontal axis, and then they also plotted over that the slow growth period. And they talked about, and they, and they changed the units. Um, and so on the, on the vertical axis, we're plotting pound production, so how much grass is, is, is uh, growing or, or compiling out there over this period of time. And so it points out that in the short, real, sh you know, fast growing period or slow growing period, real short recovery periods, you don't get as much production versus if you can stretch it out for these short and long growing uh, seasons, you can have significantly more production if you just give that plant a little more time to recover itself and to regrow. And this comes right out of our National Range and Pasture Handbook. There's a lot more you could read about it if you really want to dig into it a little more. So now we're going to shift a little and talk about this um, other element that we need to consider when we're talking about what impacts forage, and that's selective grazing. Selective grazing or spot grazing can impact the intensity, frequency, and duration of grazing that a particular plant experiences within a paddock within a grazing period, depending on, depending on the length of that grazing period. Um, selective grazing is directly correlated with plant palatability. The more palatable it is, the more it's going to be selected for, generally. And we know plant palatability is directly linked to forage quality, right? We talked about that. The lower the fiber, the higher the protein, and if there's no toxins in it, it's generally going to be a very palatable plant. So we can have selective grazing occurring within a species. Animals are kind of like kids, and if you give them a choice, they're going to eat the tastiest, best things. We talk about certain plants being ice cream forage plants or candy. And, um, you know, just like kids, they're rarely going to go to the broccoli if they don't have to. Um, we know that plants are most palatable when they're young, and so we often see that in a, in a grazing paddock, in a grazing situation, if the plants are, if the animals have young plants available to them, that's generally what they're going to eat first versus older rank stuff, they're usually going to avoid that. And so they will selectively graze younger plants before they'll graze um, older, more mature plants because the digestibility declines, right, and crude protein levels decline, and we know that that, that older plant just represents um, not as tasty, more difficult to digest um, forage to, to that grazing animal than a nice young succulent plant. We also have selective grazing occurring with, between species. And so this picture has got a bunch of uh, bird's foot trefoil intermixed with kikuyu grass. And palatability uh, between species is going to be based on primarily either morphological differences, whether the, how coarse the, the leaf is or the leaf to stem ratio, which is related to the forage quality, or the chemical differences, sec whether they're secondary compounds that limit intake or that um, impart odors or flavors. Um, some of them might be toxic. Um, and then again, these, these quality differences of fiber level and crude protein. So in this picture, I put ice cream all over the legume because that's generally going to be higher quality, more digestible, usually going to be selected for when animals first get in a pasture. Um, and then they, they eat the grass too, so don't get me wrong. The grass is still good, but it's not as tasty. It's not as yummy as the legume. So um, Laura, you asked a little bit about diet selection before, so I hope this is helping. Um, a little bit. There's a lot more to it, but we're just trying to get the basic concepts out there. Selective grazing between species also influence on these chemical differences like toxicity, and this is kind of a big one. We, we work in grazing areas that have um, a lot of toxic plants. Um, this is the one that a lot of Big Island and Maui folks are going to be very familiar with, fireweed. Um, it 
has the ability to completely take over pastures and that's partly because of the selective grazing that occurs on a pasture whereby the animals really won't touch it. Um, they will graze anything and everything else first and you know an infestation like this definitely is going to have an impact on that site's forage productive capability. So let's just hold on a second and let's start to pull together some of what we've been talking about just now related to selective grazing and plant response to grazing and let's just take a second also to make sure that everyone understands what this second bite refers to. So this experiment that we looked at, while it was really good at illustrating the effect of heavy continuous grazing on production versus the rotational system, but it also gives us a good opportunity to talk about the second bite. Overgrazing occurs on a plant-by-plant -plant basis. With selective grazing, we know that animals will prefer certain plants over others. So let's look at the plant on the right. It's in a pasture that got grazed on the first day. Now let's just say that on the sixth day, that herd is still in there. How do you think those leaves look to a grazing animal? They're nice and young and succulent. They're probably pretty tasty. And it's long enough now that a grazing animal could, could actually get it in their mouth. So a cow, for example, probably could, could get their tongue around that and pull it in. Sheep and goats, you know, even easier. And if everything in the pasture is less appetizing for whatever reason, maybe the other plants have, you know, reduced quality, or maybe some of them are toxic, or they're just, you know, too stemmy or whatever, um, this plant is going to be very vulnerable to getting grazed again, especially if there's not much of it out there. That's the second bite. If this plant used its stored energy to put these solar panels back up, only for them to get grazed again before it had a chance to replenish itself, it now has even less energy to draw from to produce these same solar panels, these new leaves again. And if this new growth were to be grazed off, there would also likely be an impact to those roots. So I just want to take a second to kind of talk about that one more time using this example because it's all these concepts all together in different types of grazing systems that can affect plant composition. Okay. We're going to go through uh, one more slide and then I'll have some time for any questions. This again is out of the National Range and Pasture Handbook and I thought it was really neat because it helps to show how, um, how different types of grazing can have an impact on plant composition. So um, this just helps to show that shifts in a plant species composition, they're usually unintentional and, and they can ha happen really actually kind of quickly under different grazing regimes. This, um, these graphs show uh, a site they tracked for six years of applying three different types of stock of grazing management to three sections of this pasture. It was all seeded the same, it's a uniform mixture at the beginning, and it just watched and, and tracked it. So the first graph shows the shift in pasture species where the stocking was light, but it was continuous. It was a set stock grazing situation. Spot grazing was happening, leaving high stubble heights in ungrazed areas. The taller upright grasses were favored over the Kentucky bluegrass, which is a soliniferous grass. Uh, Canada bluegrass is less palatable. It really took off. Timothy grass decreased. That, that I understand is a real desirable grass. It decreased after an initial increase um, I guess there was a drought in the fourth year. Um, white clover never really gained any ground because the, the stubble heights, the grasses were so high because it was such a light stocking rate um, that the sunlight never really got to it and never really was able to get a, get a, good, um, foot, get a foot, good foothold in there. The second graph shows the result of heavy continuous grazing. The, the grazing was, that was real close. The, the stubble heights were very short. And that promoted a Kentucky bluegrass at nearly the expense of everything else. The white clover was initially favored, but it decreased in, in, year, in, um, in the final two years because of dry weather. Uh, Timothy grass also pretty much disappeared from the stand because it was just repeatedly grazed off and, and never had a chance to recover. The Canada bluegrass recovery in the final year uh, was because of a weakened Kentucky bluegrass stand because of the drought. And so, you know, we're seeing different levels of intensity, frequency, and duration, and the impact to, to a, a pasture species composition. The third one is showing the effect of heavy grazing, but in a rotational system. 
So the Kentucky bluegrass and the white clover were favored because the grazing height was pretty close. It was still fairly intensively, uh, there was still quite an intense impact on the grass. Most of the taller grasses pretty much disappeared. Uh, Timothy was not grazed during stem elongation. So they actually managed to allow the Timothy grass to head out and set seed in order to um, restore food reserves and, and maintain its persistence in the pasture. Um, less palatable grass, the Canada bluegrass, is, is actually being utilized in this situation because the animals are, are subject to a tighter grazing, um, grazing unit. Um, the, the writers in this, in this section of the book also did take the, the time to note that they looked at the, the gain data um, in the published report, and it was also evident that the animals really weren't given enough forage. They, the, animal, the forage animal balance was pretty off, and the animals really were forced to eat everything that they were given. But the point for this is to see that the way that a site is grazed is going to affect the plant composition. Whether in, in good or bad, it just depends on the client's objectives and the impact to their, to their resource base. Okay, I'm just going to pause for a minute. I don't have any quiz questions this time. Um, I kind of took it down to the wire trying to get these, these PowerPoints together and done. But does anyone have any questions right now? I have one question. The, sure. um, the fire grass, um, fireweed. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the guys on Lanai are having that problem now. What, 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 uh, what's, that's the resource concern. What's the conservation measure? Um, I was under the impression on Lanai that there were not too many livestock producers still there. Is, well, they're kind of, they're going to amp those guys up, where, and okay. some of this is uh -huh. in that area. Okay. They don't um, want to keep the hotels. Yeah, well, there's there's definite grazing measures that you can that they can implement in order to try to make sure that they're trying to keep a good healthy stand of grass that can compete with that with the fireweed. And then there are some chemical approaches that can be taken as well. Um, Multi-species grazing could be an option that could be discussed. Um, it just depends on on the nature of the problem and why it's coming in. In this uh, scenario that I showed the picture of. This site was um, pretty much continuously grazed, and so that was contributing to the degree of fireweed infestation that they were that they were experiencing. Um, so continuous grazing will create this situation, and so you know making sure that they have some form of a rotation uh, would be a very good first start. We're going to get into some of that a little bit more when we get into um, the conservation planning on grazing land, Wally, but thank you for bringing that up. Okay, thanks. Sure. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, let's keep going then. Um, so now we're going to talk about some of the different systems that are out there. Um, don't worry too much if some of this, you know, goes kind of, is, is, is somewhat confusing. I'm going to try to call out the ones that we see the most often here in, in the islands, but um, I do want you to be aware that all of these kind of things exist. They're out there. So we have three classes of methods. There's the allocation stocking methods. There are nutritional optimization stocking methods, which, um, and then there's seasonal stocking methods. And so this difference between the terms of stocking versus grazing, um, herbivores graze, but livestock producers stock them. So that's why some of them are going to be described um, with those two different terms, and I just want you to be a little aware of that. So starting with the allocation stocking methods. There are four basic allocation methods. Continuous or set stock method is where the same number of animals are on one pasture unit all the time. The animal numbers might remain constant, but like we learned about in the livestock, um, in our livestock session, their forage and, nutri and their nutritional needs can change, right, throughout the year based on all kinds of factors. Selective grazing is real difficult to control in this type of a system. And the system is, 
usually um, inefficient and has to be lighter stocked and often ends up with problems here in the islands at least with more weeds or undesirable species coming in and soil erosion can, can occur in our more arid sites. Um, it can be used somewhat successfully when a pasture is used seasonally with a short-term herd on forages that keep their quality for a while. It's not real common here in the islands again, but it's possible and it is done in other places. The continuous variable stocking is basically the same as set stock, except that an additional area can be added on occasionally or, or where animal numbers fluctuate. I've seen this type of system mostly with uh, ranches that keep a cull cow paddock, where they will add cull cows in there for a short amount of time until they're able to get a booking to e or either sell them at the gate or get a booking at the slaughterhouse to get them um, taken out. Sometimes these are called put and take pastures, so that's kind of what this type of a system can involve. And then there's the set rotational stocking. Probably the most common system we help people to adopt. Um, this method is most useful on pastures where forage growth rates vary, just you know, vary just a little, and we have more or less year-round growing conditions. Most tropical grasses need some kind of a recovery period in order to persist, and so they they tend to do pretty well on their rotation. Most of our producers also are part-time weekend warriors, so. A set grazing period is more manageable than a flexible one. These systems can be simple or they can be more intensive depending on the circumstances. Um, the weakness of this system is that it can be rather inflexible to adjust with changing growing conditions. Um, a system that sized appropriately for average conditions you know, would probably be inadequate during a drought. Um, this can be addressed in a number of ways. Such as, keeping, uh, such as adjusting the grazing period, in which case it wouldn't be set anymore, um, or keeping a stockpile paddock on the side, or stocking conservatively, or having an option to destock if necessary, having some alternative pasture somewhere. And then the fourth of the allocation stocking methods is this variable rotation stocking. Basically a highly tuned rotational system. It's highly flexible, paddocks are grazed based on forage growth rates, and when the growth rates are fast, the stock are rotated through fewer paddocks, and then the extra paddocks can be harvested or stockpiled. Um, they say harvested in the book because people hay on the mainland. Um, not many of our producers here have haying, but they can be stockpiled, and when the growth is slower or there's a need for more pasture, more, more, more forage, the, the number of paddocks in the pasture area can be expanded. Keep in mind, none of these systems are set in stone, and most of the time what we see out there are hybrids of different methods. Okay, next slide. Nutritional optimization methods. So like the title says, this really seeks to optimize nutrition. And these methods are associated with either rotational or set stock methods and are generally used to selectively feed livestock. So you might see people with animals that they are grass finishing or that otherwise need a higher quality forage. They, they might use some, some of these types of methods or hybrids of them. Uh, first last grazing systems stock groups of animals separately based on their nutritional performance needs. Examples of this might be grazing heifers or grass finishing steers ahead of the cow herd in, in the first grazers bu uh, bunch. And then the cow herd would be in the last grazers bunch. Um, another option would be where lactating dairy cows are grazed ahead of heifers and dry cows. Um, in order to avoid reducing plant vigor, the combined grazing period for, these, for this type of system between the two groups should probably not exceed about seven days. Um, creep grazing systems are similar to first last grazing systems in that the young animals are allowed access to forage that their moms can't get to. The difference is that the young have access to both the paddock their mothers are in and the next paddock in the rotation. So that's how it's different than the first last grazing. Uh, this is a system that can sometimes be used to increase weaning weight. Some management intensive grazing systems are um, high, basically highly tuned strip grazing systems um, where the fences are moved to provide fresh pasture. Utilization is maximized by stocking animals in areas with limited fresh forage at any one time. Intake per animal tends to be increased because livestock respond to freshly offered pasture by grazing it pretty much as soon as it becomes available. 
With higher intake comes improved performance. This system uses pasture very pasture areas very efficiently, but it's considerably more labor intensive and probably best suited to real high performing classes of livestock. And then there's uh, frontal grazing. It's kind of like strip grazing, but only the front fence is moved. Um, you have less loss to trampling, but the back areas could be subject to repeat grazing. So this type of system is better used in situations where there's little to no regrowth potential. Okay. Remember this graph? I, pulled, I put it up on, during our grazing animals session. And it, it, again, it, again, it just helps to emphasize how different classes of animals have different nutritional needs. And those nutritional optimization methods really seek to ration the available forage to allow those with the high, with those animals with the higher needs to access that forage first when it's when there's more of it available um, and it's and it's more desirable. And then they follow up with a class of animal with a lower forage requirement um, in order to kind of clean up that pasture. Okay. Seasonal stocking methods are another strategy that seeks to stock pastures based on seasonal availability of forage or appropriate conditions for grazing. These two main, the two main methods are described here. Um, sequence grazing plans uh, graze to match season availability of different forages. As we don't really have major seasonality on our grazing lands out here, this method probably isn't that common. Um, deferred stocking is another method where areas may be deferred for a season in order to allow forage to stockpile or where livestock are kept out of an area for a certain time of year, maybe because grazing could be damaging or disruptive due to environmental or maybe habitat conditions. I've seen one producer who deferred his dry, harsh Mackay pasture all year until winter um, when the days were cooler. The, stock, the feed would stockpile down there and when he would go down and graze during the winter, that stockpile could hold its cattle through most of the winter and the cooler temperatures made it easier on the animals. The winter was also the dry time, so the forages were not growing down there, but his Malka areas would be able to, um, where it, it did receive some rain during the winter, would get the recovery time coupled with the good growing conditions and allow those pastures to recover fairly well with that long extended rest. Okay, so those are the different types of methods wanted to kind of do an overview on that. Again, the ones that we see most commonly are these uh, set rotational or variable rotational. We usually see folks out here, we try to get them on some kind of a rotational grazing because it tends to help with most of the resource concerns that our grazing lands experience. But just know that there are these more complex systems depending on the producer's objectives. And the main thing to understand is that whatever system we're working with a client to, to try to adopt or um, however they're trying to change it it, it, it must be sensitive to what their needs and goals are, um, and the system has to match the producer. Any questions? Okay, let's keep going. Key tools, okay, so some of the main tools when we're talking in grazing management. Um, stocking rate versus stocking density, the carrying capacity, um, the seasonal distribution, again, of, uh, some of these we talked about already, uh, seasonal distribution of forage, the intensity, frequency, timing, and duration of grazing, all of these things are tools that we can use um, in grazing management. Because all of them are effective, you know, and these all help to answer the questions of how many and what kind of animal are we having in the system, where and how long and when do they graze, when do they come back, and you know what are their performance goals and are we getting those met? So let's start by defining some terms. A lot of people use the term stocking rate and stock density interchangeably. They're not. I know I, it took me a long time to understand the difference too. Um, stocking rate is the units of animals per unit area per season or year. Okay, so in this situation our stocking rate is six cows per 60 acres or one cow to 10 acres. And if we assume that one cow was 1,000 pounds, then we have one animal unit to 10 acres in this illustration. And if we wanted to talk about the stock density, it's the same because it's just one big pasture. Um, our stock density is also one animal unit to 10 acres. 
Um, sometimes, though, when people are talking in terms of stock density, producers will speak in terms of pounds of animal per unit area, which we can also do here. So six cows at 1,000 pounds would be 6,000 pounds per acre or 100 pounds per acre, a very light stock density. <laughs> okay, now let's take those same 60 acres and let's cut them up into six 10-acre paddocks. Our stocking rate is still the same. We still have six cows on 60 acres, or one to 10 animal to acre ratio, but now our stock density has changed. Now we have six animal units on 10 acres, or one animal unit per 1.6 acres, or if we wanna speak in terms of pounds, we're at about 600 pounds per acre, okay? So in this situation, whereas the last situation, the pasture was grazed 100% of the time and rested never, this pasture is grazed 16% of the time, and it's resting 84% of the time. So there's gonna be a big difference there in a lot of different ways with a system like this. Let's do it again. And let's say we took those 60 acres and instead we put in 24 two and a half acre paddocks. Our stocking rate is still the same. We still got six cows on 60 acres, assuming the client hasn't increased his herd. Um, but now our stock density has changed. Now we have six animal units on two and a half acres or one animal unit per 4.2 acres or 2,400 pounds per acre. We've increased our density 24 times since our original density, which was 100 pounds per acre. And you know, in reality, you'd see a real difference in the pasture out here, which would probably allow the producer to stock at a few more than six cows on these 60 acres. Okay, but just for the point of illustrating the difference between stocking rate and stock density, um, I hope this illustration helped. Um, different grazing systems, you know, might use the same stocking rate, but different stock densities. And it's those different densities that has the effect, that have the, and the uh, correlated grazing and recovery period that have the ability to impact production and pasture composition. All right, so um, like I said, different systems might use the same stocking rate, but um, it's gonna affect the density. The stocking rate together with the system determine the intensity, the frequency, and the duration of grazing. So again, all of those things like we talked about all affect plant composition. Okay, let's talk about carrying capacity for a minute. Carrying capacity is not the same as stocking rate or stock density. Uh, stocking rate is the number of animals on the pasture. Carrying capacity is the number or capacity of animals that a pasture can carry without damaging the resource base. Stocking rates can vary in the short term depending on the operation, but the carrying capacity is really looking at trying to describe the average sustainable production over the long term can be a very useful tool when trying to manage towards uh, sustainability, but it's also inherently difficult to calculate. It's really hard be because it's subject to the variations across the site in veg composition, in forage use patterns, in livestock demand. Um, the time of the year that you go out and do the sampling can have an effect. The actual sample site selection is, is gonna have an effect. Uh, variation in landscape and weather fluctuations you know, it, it, it's, it can be really difficult to pin down, but it's a very valuable tool. Um, Global Rangelands had this great line that I wanted to put in here. So an evaluation of carrying capacity should be treated as a preliminary gauge to animal numbers for the management unit that will be revised in the light of monitoring information and immediate forage conditions. So. We can estimate a site's carrying capacity based on what it looks like today, but it should be something that we revisit, particularly if we are making changes such that the grazing is gonna change because we should expect to see some impact to the pasture composition potentially. And if there's an impact to the pasture composition or its productive capabilities, then we would wanna revisit the site's carrying capacity, particularly if we based it on field collected data like clipping. Um, so it's a good gauge, but it's something that it's a number that we want to look at, you know, uh, repeatedly, especially as we're monitoring and we're seeing changes in the forage conditions. 
forage animal balance is, is, is another really useful tool um, and, and really critical. A forage animal balance is basically making sure that the stocking rate is balanced with a site's productive capability or carrying capacity like we just talked about. And again, it's, it's really tricky like we just described and depending on the complexity of the, of the agricultural operation or the site and when you factor in all the things that can affect an animal or a herd's nutritional needs and the unpredictability of weather, it, it really gives you an appreciation for how grazing management is. It is a lot of science, but it's also a lot of art. And so it's, it's a difficult thing. It's kind of like trying to hit a moving target most of the time, but there are tools that we can use in order to try to get you know, pretty close approximations. And then just really critical that we work closely with our producers and talk about what are the principles of grazing management that we're trying to apply, what are the, um, if, what are the responses that we're trying to look for in the pasture, and making sure that we're not overstocked so that we're not, not achieving those, we're also not too far understocked, and that the system is helping him to get towards his objectives. So getting into the nitty gritty a little bit more on the forage animal balance. Um, if, when we're talking about demand, in, in the forage animal balance, you're talking in terms of either pounds of forage or animal units, either animal unit days, animal unit months, or animal unit years, because all of those are just different measures of forage, right? And so when we're looking at a benchmark situation, we need to try to pin down what kind and how many animals are grazing the landscape and converting those into animal units, um, finding out are all those animals grazed all together or if they're in separate herds, when do they graze together or separately, where, is, are they grazing on that whole system all year, do some of those animals only come out there for part of the year, um, what are the goals, what are those animals used for, what are they producing, because that's going to affect what their intake rate might be. And then this is the calculation. We take the number of animal units multiplied by that intake rate and the time that we're, that we're trying to um, look at, which for us most of the time we're, we're making sure that for the year we're pretty much balanced, but you can also look at it per month or day even. And that'll give you your demand, in, in, again, in pounds or animal unit days or months or years, whatever term um, is comfortable for you. And then when we look on the supply side, again, we're talking the same terms of pounds. We've got to be apples and apples, right? So either pounds or uh, one of the forms of animal units. And then so to come up with the supply, we have to have an idea on what the production, like how much pounds per acre are produced on the site, how many acres are available and grazable, and then an idea on the grazing efficiency that's going to be impacted by the system. Um, not all the acres are the same you know, in production too, so we have to kind of look at that and ask ourselves, are there, is it different? Is forage composition, the pasture composition change from one area to another? Really large grazing systems, it can, if you're going from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, for example, or sometimes across soil types or other plant cover. So um, we need to try to start pinning some of those numbers down in order to calculate a forage animal balance. So where do we get those numbers? Well. We'll talk about that in the grazing land inventory. But before we go there, does anybody have any questions? We're at almost 2 o'clock, and we got about another 10 or 11 slides. So if no one has any questions yet, then we'll go into this section of this webinar for today, and then we can have definitely more time for questions at the end. So we start getting those numbers as well as a lot of other information that we need when we're planning on grazing land in our inventory process. The planning process, yay! The one thing we all know and love, um, it's involving three phases. The first phase is the one that we're going to focus on today, um, and it all kind of works together, and these arrows should really go both ways because they can go both ways. Sometimes the way the process is described, it seems like it really has to go in an order. Step one is to identify problems, and step two is to determine the objectives, and then we inventory the resources, and then we analyze the data. Well, I found that when you're working in this first phase, you're really doing them all together. As you're working with your client, developing a relationship, getting an idea of what's going on, starting to try to understand his operation, what his goals are, and, and, you know, just doing your, your inventory. Um, 
you, it, it takes a lot of time and you find, I find that you're kind of doing these all together as you're slowly starting to see the picture more and more clearly. Um, and, and it's really important that we do this, this step really well because we, it's critical that we have a good understanding of what's going on out there and what the client's objectives are and make sure that they understand too what's going on out there so that together we might figure out ways that we might try to help them um, get, get to their objectives. Okay, a slide with a lot of words, I know. But I put this in here for your reference. I pulled this out of the National Range and Pasture Handbook again. Chapter 11 is all on conservation planning on grazing lands. And um, this, that, that chapter really, tr really works to break down that planning process, to talk about what we're trying to do in each step and how we do it. And so for these first four steps, you know, in identifying the problems, we're going to start, the client's going to identify what their perceived problems are but our job is to try to help them make, you know, make sure that they have a good understanding of what's going on on their grazing land ecosystem and make sure that we're trying to help them understand the causes of those problems. And so in, in, in moving towards doing that, we're inventorying the resources and we're identifying you know, with them the symptoms of the problems and starting to try to correlate that to what might be the cause. Um, in determining objectives, the client will express their management objectives but it's our job to try to help them again, make sure they understand what's going on out there and that their objectives are ecologically, economically, and socially sound, you know, to the degree that we can. Going on to the next, fa next phase or step is what this is the one, is um, the inventory stage. And, and this one really is a whopper <coughs> when it comes to um, conservation planning in general. But, you know, there's a lot of different things that we're trying to, um, pin down or identify or measure in the inventory phase um, on grazing land. Some of these include, you know, whether we have different vegetation types or zones out on, a, out on an operation, um, recording where all of the infrastructure is. We, we kind of got to know where their fences are, where the troughs and, and tanks, and if they have reservoirs or whatever, how does their water system function, or do they have, is there roads, is, there, is the areas all accessible, um, where is their corral, where do they have to get to to work their animals. Um, all of those things are going to help us to evaluate grazing distribution um, and identifying key grazing sites and species. We've got to look at and see is there any soil erosion going on. We, have to, we want to consider the water sources for the livestock and what is their quality and how much can they, do they store or deliver, what's their capacity and, and yield. Um, we've got to come up with a forage inventory. That's where we start getting the information that we need for our forage animal balance. And likewise, our livestock and in, in, in places where we've got significant wildlife pressure, we've got to get an idea of what that looks like. And so get an inventory there so, again, we can use that when looking at our forage animal balance. Evaluating that benchmark forage animal balance, <coughs> trying to um, get, our he get our heads around and understanding what the animal husbandry practices are um, and what their livestock performance is, is at for their benchmark situation, and then, of course, always if there's any cultural resources or endangered species or habitat. All of those things we should be starting to identify in this, um, we should be identifying, I'm sorry, in this inventory stage. And all that information gets used in this next stage of, an of analysis. This is where we are working with the producer to evaluate their current grazing lands and in relation to the site potential. On the Big Island where we have some um, ecological site descriptions, we have some of those as tools. Um, David Clausus is working on the rest of the islands, but even without that, we, we should be able to have a pretty good idea of what a grazing site's potential could be as far as species composition and um, trying to get an idea of production. So in the analysis stage, um, this is where we are using our different tools in order to determine the vigor and, and health of the plant species in the pastures, um, how well the, the uniformity of the grazing is across the place, um, the suitability and desirability for the existing plant species, whether the current grazing management is, um, is getting the producer what they want in terms of forage quality and quantity or if it could be improved, looking at forage production again in relation to the, the site's potential, and then seeing if there's any way, if, if we can influence the balance between forage production and forage requirements or that forage animal balance in order to help them um, move towards their objective. Okay, those are a lot of words, and here's another slide with more words, but, you know, what does that look like today? Um, you know, our, our planning tools 
change all the time. Um, we're now with, what is it, Toolkit 9 and talking about getting really crazy with the conservation desktop later. But it's still, it's still the same um, basic premise of trying to get an idea of what we have to work with. So that starts out generally with making a bunch of maps your general, you know, run-of-the-mill resource inventory maps, like your soils, topo, precip, threatened and endangered species, aerial images, what are we, what are we looking at? Um, sometimes other maps come in handy. Um, sometimes old cane field maps are handy because sometimes those old roads are still there or they can give you an idea of what was done on a site before. Sometimes even the geology layer, I found really interesting information that sometimes kind of shi shines a little bit of light to try to explain what we're seeing out on a site. And then starting to inventory those sites and develop different shape files is really helpful. So you want to be able to represent where the fences are, where the pipelines are, where the, all the elements of the water system are, where is the corral, where are the roads. This becomes a huge tool that you can use when you're talking with your producer or when you're working with your engineer or your grazing management specialist or anyone, even your other, other planners in your office that might have you know, more experience with grazing land work. If you can. Uh, illustrate and, and put into a map where all these different features are, it's really helpful. Being able to show and measure your vegetation zones and the grazable areas, because again, we need to know how many acres of each zone is producing approximately how much feed so that we can try and arrive at a forage animal balance. And if there's brush or herbaceous weed problems, we've got to know where those are. Um, if there's soil erosion problems, we also want to know where those are because that's going to have an impact to forage production. You know, when you're trying to get all of this information, the producer is, is really your, your landmine of, you know, your mind of where you're going to get all that information. And some of them nowadays, they use GIS and they'll even share their data, and that's awesome. Some of them are using Google Earth. We can transform KMZs, bring them into ArcGIS. Um, but most of them, even if they don't have GIS, they're, they know their site, they know their place, and if you give them a blank imagery, you know, a, a copy of their uh, aerial image, sometimes they can draw them on, or sometimes they can sketch them out for you. At least then you know what you're looking for, and then when you spend some time studying the aerial image, you can start to see some signatures on the landscape sometimes of what, what might be out there. You might be able to see a difference in grazing uh, that might indicate there's a fence, or you might see a heavy impact area that might indicate there's a trough and you zoom in far enough, hey, sure enough, there's a trough there, and that's right where the producer said there should be one. So digitize as much as you can off of those producer-provided maps, or even sometimes they, I've had them come in and work with me over the shoulder and kind of show me, oh, yeah, should have one trough someplace over here, and we'll go in. And sometimes it's too new, so you can't see it. Um, sometimes there's too much tree cover, so sometimes you got to go out and GPS, whatever you can identify. And as you're building this database, whenever possible, stick information in that attribute table. If you can stick in there, for example, what your fence type is, if there's differences between barb and woven, um, it's particularly related to the water system. If you can populate that table with what type and size of pipe you might have or the tank capacity or trough size, material, all of those things will come in really handy when you're trying to an analyze their water system if, if water is an issue or if you later discover water is an issue. It's really important to try to get the big picture and GIS is one of the most powerful tools that we have at our disposal and it's super useful even to the producer because sometimes they don't have a good map. They might have an idea of how many acres that back section is but they've never actually had it measured. And these are all, it's all good information that we can give them and just make them even better decision makers. So in addition to what we have out on the ground and what we have in the form of our natural resources, we've also got to get an idea, again, on what that livestock inventory is made up of. What are they grazing? How many of them? When and where? Do they have them in different herds? What paddocks do those different herds use? We've got to get an idea of what they're doing so that we can look at their benchmark situation and determine some of the causes of what of some of the problems that we might see out on the landscape. Okay, um, associated with that, we can start working on our stock water inventory worksheet, which Drew is going to talk about next. And then also is is um, using our vegetation inventory and analyses tools. So we're going to talk. We're going to get some hands-on experience with these and, and training and practice with these next week. Um, we have our conservation planning tech note seven, which helps us to inventory vegetation on a site. 
our grazing land condition score sheet and trend worksheet, and then our prescribed grazing worksheets and planning tools. These are all at your disposal, and some of these are kind of required in order to populate your resource inventory worksheet um, or checklist, but they're all meant to help um, help plan help all, all the planners to evaluate and analyze a grazing land situation for some of these things that are really important, like plant vigor and pasture composition and soil erosion and all of these things, pasture utilization. They're all incorporated in there. So a lot of the terms that we talked about today, if you're not clear on any of them, let's, let's spend the time today to get any questions that I can answered. And then hopefully as we go through some of using some of these tools next week in the field, it'll get more and more clear. It, it, you know, and, and I, I'm the first to acknowledge that this, this work, it really can take some time depending on the complexity of the situation, what, what the producer that's signing up, you know, is, is coming in with. If they're coming in with 20 acres, that's one thing. If they're coming in with 200 or 500 or 8,000, that's another. And so it is really important to get the big picture. Now, that, what, what that looks like, if it's just 20 acres, it should be able to be that whole 20 acres. If it's 200 acres and one herd, we should be able to get the 200 acres. If it's 8,000 acres, you know, yeah, we can focus on sections at a time for sure, but um, always moving towards trying to get towards the big picture. And when it comes to their water system, sometimes it's very difficult to analyze it without a pretty good idea of the big picture. Okay? So uh, in our inventory map, these are just some examples. You know, you can start out when you have your TMK lines with getting your basic, you know, so soil information, looking at how much diversity you have out there, what's the approximate rainfall, and then looking at an aerial image for what you can start to pick out. In this, in this example, I've got the fence lines pretty much um, drawn in here. And then from there, you can look at the grazable areas. And so with your time in the field, looking at what's really going on inside these little gullies, what, you know, whether they're actually grazable or not, whether they should be counted as contributing towards forage that, you know, that, that should be counted in the forage inventory or not. Um, th that's, that's useful. You need those numbers. And then the water system and being able to uh, properly inventory that and identify what's going on with that such that you can analyze it and have that information available for future planning. And so now I'm going to pass it over to a guy way smarter than me uh, <laughs> to talk about this um, element of conservation planning on grazing land, um, Mr. Drew Stout. Yay! Uh, hi. I wish I was smart as Carolyn, but uh, no, we're very lucky to have her. And so we're going to talk a little bit about our inventory, our stock water pipeline resource inventory worksheet. So, Hopefully you guys have seen this before. Uh, we have an electronic copy of this on our PIA webpage. If you look under technical resources and then under engineering, and then there's a section on spreadsheets. So there's several electronic versions of these floating around, but there are also paper versions that you can get out of the Stockwater Handbook. So this is a tool that you can use to document um, what's out there existing and see if it's going to be adequate. You can also use this for evaluating different alternatives that you're coming up with the producer. And then finally, you're going to use this to document um, the capacity of your design work to make sure that you're meeting the recharge rate, basically. So as you go through this worksheet, um, it's going to ask you for the type of livestock. It asks you for the type of grazing system. And then next, it asks for the maximum number of livestock. And me personally, I like to work in animal units. Um, this spreadsheet is from Susan Kubo, so she had already converted it to animal units. So this number is pretty critical. Um, before you can ever design a stock water system, um, the planner and the producer have to agree on what this number is going to be. Because if that number changes, either up or down, then your system is going to change. So. Um, I rely on the planners and the producers to come up with this number together. And it, to me, it's, it's really critical that everybody agrees before you get too far down, down the line. 
Uh, next, typical dates stock water be in the field. Uh, here in Hawaii, it's typically year-round. Uh, next is water requirement per head or animal unit. Um, for this example, it was 15. So this is a, an interesting number. Um, we used to pull this number directly from our watering facility standard. We had a table right on the, uh, the first page that would tell you the number you're going to use. Uh, we recently updated that standard. So now instead of giving you a table, it's going to give you some references to pull that number from. So it says refer to National Range and Pasture Handbook Chapter 6 or you can refer to state guidance, or you can refer to university publications. So there's three different sources there, and they're going to give you three different answers, but typically it's going to be a range. So if you look at the uh, Pasture Handbook Chapter 6, um, for beef cattle, it's going to give you a range of 6 to 18 gallons a day. And then if you look at our Stock water handbook, for a range cow, it's going to give you a range of 12 to 15 gallons a day. And then, you know, your local university might give you a different number. Uh, for me, I've been using what was in the standard uh, for a long time, which was 12 gallons a day per cow. And I use that as an animal unit. So if it's, say, it's a cow-calf operation, uh, you might count the cow and the calf as, say, 1.4 animal units and come up with something close to 17 gallons a day for that. Uh, so to me, it's important to be consistent. So I, like I said, I typically use 12, and that's the minimum. You can always use more. Uh, so in this example, the producer wanted to use 15, which was fine. Um, so then you're just going to multiply your animal units by your requirement. And for this example, we got uh, 1,095. And then we add 10% for evaporation and spillage. And then we look at a trough volume. So you might want to look at existing troughs that are out there. Um, this might be a part where you're evaluating different alternatives. So you're talking to the producer about you know, alternative trough sizes that they could use. Uh, so this one was uh, what we used for design, which is 350 gallons. And then you basically look at that, that storage in the trough versus the total requirement, the line right above, and you come up with a percentage. So this one, you get that trough at 350 gallons when, it, when it's full has 29% of the daily needs. And then you can take that percent and go down to table one, and it's going to pull a, a time out that you're going to use in a different equation. Um, I like to interpolate in between those points. Uh, you can round down if you want to be conservative. Uh, so in this example, we're going to jump down a few lines to that T, or to the desired number of hours. So that comes from that table one. And so we had 29%, so we used four hours. So we, we interpolated between two points there. So basically, you're going to plug that T into the next equation, and then you're going to come up with a delivery flow rate. So that's the box there uh, highlighted, or not highlighted, but in bold. So we have a requirement of 5.188 gallons per minute. That's our flow rate. So that's our delivery rate. And what I, I try to emphasize when I do my stock water training is that flow rate correlates directly to a pipe size. So it's important that, you know, the planner and the client and who's ever doing the design all understand what that means. So in this scenario, we used a 350-gallon trough, and to get that five gallons a minute, um, in the design, we used a three-quarter inch pipe. So at this point, you know, when you're going over the alternatives, um, if something, you know, doesn't sit well with somebody, if they say, oh, that, that trough is too big, um, then you make adjustments. So if we used a smaller trough, then our flow rate would go up, which would probably correlate to a larger pipe size. So there, there's a connection there between the pipe and the trough. And the producer, they get to pick one, but they, they can't pick the size of both of those elements. 
unless they're a good trouble engineer, <laughs> they guess it right. <laughs> unless they guess it right. <laughs> so it, it's important that everybody agrees, you know, at at this point before you move on, because if you don't, you know, if if you run that calculation and you need, say, 40 gallons a minute, and they say they want to use a three-quarter inch pipeline, there's going to be a problem there. So this, this is just a tool, like I said, you can use it to document the existing, what's out there. You can use it for evaluating your alternatives. And then finally, you're going to use it to document your design calculations. Um, so you're going to need a, a map to go, to go with this. So that's on the left. So this is uh, the conservation plan map, which documents what was out there. So in this design, or in this uh, system, we had an existing pond on the very top. And then we had uh, a meter, a uh, county meter, uh, coming in at the middle where, the, where that little break in the fence is. So we actually had two different water sources in this one. And there is an existing trough on the right-hand side that's documented, and then the yellow is uh, new troughs that we added. So as, as a designer, you know, I rely on the planner to give me the, the animal units. And then I rely on the planner to kind of come up with where the fence lines are going to go and then the trough locations. And then I feel like it's my job to come up with some different alternatives to get that water delivered there. And then if we have to move something, that I communicate that. So in this, this example, we had uh, the trough splitting some fence lines which I, I try just to give people advantages and disadvantages of different options. So when you split a fence line like this, you know, there's an advantage. There's, uh, there's a lower cost in doing it this way. But then you may have higher pressure right there at that trough against that fence line. So there's, there's an advantage with cost, but then a disadvantage with uh, pressure on your, your resources right there. Yes. So there is no one right way of doing it. There's hopefully several good ways of doing it, and then the client gets to decide what works the best. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you just you start out documenting what's there, and then you flow through into those alternatives, and then you come up with a final solution, basically. Uh, is there any questions for me on this worksheet or where you find it? No? Okay, so I, I would recommend that you look at our new watering facility standard and also our new pipeline standard that came out the end of last year. And go ahead and read those again. Um, a lot of the information that was in the standard is now moving to the stock water handbook, which is getting updated currently. So you're going to notice a big difference. So the watering facility went from 12 pages long, the standard, to five pages. And so all the tables that were in there are now gone, and they're going to be housed in the uh, Stockwater Handbook, which is basically where they came out of. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Drew. I appreciate that. So I asked him to, to speak to this because he's he's got – so much good experience and, and he's really great to work with in the planning process because like he said, it's always different options, but in this inventory stage, it's really difficult to know what the options might be if we don't know what's out there. So the inventory stage and being you know really thorough is really important. So the last slide. Oh. I kind of took a, took a second and, and thought about maybe what the planning process maybe more should look like. And I just wanted to take a minute to really emphasize how at the end of phase one, we're identifying the problems and getting the client's objectives and inventorying and analyzing the resources. Really critical that that's done well. If you don't have good information there, the alternatives that you come up with and start to evaluate may or may not really fix anything. And so, yeah, good planning, it does take time. But if it's done really well from the beginning, it should also save you time by not having really crazy, arduous, hopefully hopefully less, less of a potential for lots of mods. Um, and 
you know, again, without a good inventory and analysis, without properly identifying the problems and getting the information so we could determine what might be the causes of the problems, we might plan things that don't actually fix the problem. And when we attach a contract to that, well, that can get messy. God knows I had plenty of mistakes to learn from, and I'm here to help, <laughs> hopefully um, help other people avoid making similar mistakes or just provide whatever kind of assistance I can um, to, to any of you that need it. Um, so with that, next week in the classroom and field session, we're going to get some practical experience and practice using the different veg inventory and analysis tools. I know the timing isn't perfect, um, but it really never is. I fully understand and empathize with the load that you guys are all dealing with right now. Um, I'm really sincerely hopeful that some of what I'm helping, some of what I'm providing is helping you with your planning efforts this year. And as always, I'm here to help. Um, so if you need any assistance with any of your plans this year, after next week's, um, after, after I finish this training series, I'll have much more time available. But I basically plan on providing field office assistance to whatever offices that need it for the next several months. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to stop the recording, and then I'll take any questions.